Welcome to the Real Time Analytics Podcast. Why wait? The rise of real time analytics hosted by Rockset. We invite engineering, business, and thought leaders to analytics specialists to talk about their world, providing insights into what your peers are doing to improve data and application analytics. I'm your host, Gio Tropiano of Rockset. I'm here with my co host, Druba Borkathor, the co founder and CTO of Rockset. Druba, it's always great to have you on the podcast. How have you been? Yeah, good to be here. Uh, we have a great guest today. I'm excited to talk to him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Our guest today is Frederick Bjork, and he has an interesting set of milestones in his career. In 2010, Frederick founded Avatars United, which is a gaming social network. Uh, it was, um, he, sorry, it was sold to... Um, uh, to Second Life's social network, which is actually super relevant now with the work from home boom and um, in the gaming explosion. Um, since then, as CTO of The Real Real, the luxury brand, uh, an online resale marketplace, Frederick scaled The Real Real from $12 million in 2013 to $1 billion in an IPO in 2019. And he's now an angel investor with over 10 investments plus to date. Um, Frederick is, is currently investing in the serverless and space and development tools, data and infrastructure, um, with one of his most recent investments uh, being Maroxa. So Frederick, super excited to have you here today. Can't wait for this conversation. Welcome to the Real Time Analytics Podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be to be here and talk about uh, real time analytics and more. Absolutely. Before we jump into that, you're you're based in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, you've traveled a bit and and you've worked around the globe, uh, having been in Spain, in Redwood City, if I'm not mistaken, or at least in in the San Francisco area, um, of which I I used to live in Redwood City as well. It's a great area to, to at least either work or commute to. Um, the real real was out of San Francisco. You graduated from Rochester Institute of Technology. So you've spent your time uh, in various areas in the US uh, and around the world. What would you say is the biggest difference between living in the US and living in like Spain and Sweden? I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I suppose you can think about, you know, quality of life, uh, work life balance. I see, you know, the U.S. being in one extreme where you have the least amount of flexibility and vacation, but also probably, you know, the biggest possibilities to really make it big there, right? So if you think about that, you know, the lever and then you have Sweden somewhere in the middle where, you know, uh, you have pretty good quality of life. Uh, Work-life balance is pretty good, uh, but then Spain is all pleasure. <laughs> so, you know... <laughs> I would say it's probably harder to make it there. Of course, there's a lot of cool startups there, but generally when I, when I was there, it was just enjoying life, right? So it's mm -hmm. the spectrum of really enjoying life versus really enjoying working. <laughs> oh, I get it. It's the Southern, Southern European way. I spent a lot of time in Italy and I know what that's like. It's, you know, yeah. finding anybody that wants to work in August is, is like a, 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 a diamond in the rough. <laughs> it, it doesn't work. I mean, I, I like to compare, you know, like if you think about e-commerce, uh, I, you know, San Francisco arguably is like, you can get things in an hour, right? If you want it, you know, toothpaste, you'll get it. And people are quite nice. You know, the customer experience is good. Coming back to Sweden, it was not as good <laughs> as I, as I remembered it. And in Spain, which where I was early this summer, it's, yeah, it's even worse. So yeah. that's something you get used to. And it's hard to, to, to forget how good it was in the U.S. You know? mm -hmm. Well, moving to analytics then, you know, what were some of the game-changing ways um, that you used real-time analytics at the real real? Like how can real-time analytics in the, the luxury goods industry impact the business? Yeah, so, you know, if you talk about the real real for a minute, uh, they have a really interesting business model where every single SKU is unique. Right. Uh, so, which means that it's either available or it's sold. There's no depth, right? So you can't have, you know, you know, 10,000 of the same because it's not, it will, belongs to one person and it's one condition and it will be transacted upon and then it's gone. Right. So you got to make sure that your data is real time. 
Um, so that's one challenge, which is actually a pretty hard challenge because then if you start to think about how do you recommend something to someone that's available to them, because you have stores, right? You have online and you have brick and mortar and they're all working in this real-time inventory. So it's a pretty hard problem for tens of thousands of items to get added every day. Mm -hmm. um, so you have millions of items to work with and then you have to figure out, okay, how do you recommend something to someone uh, with relevant analytics, right? So that's where, <clears throat> as many people do, you start to invest in that, right? So you have to figure out for a framework, you have to do infrastructure to get behavioral data, right? So uh, purchase history, uh, browsing history, returns, size, all that stuff, and make sure it gets presented to you, you know, when you recommend items. So that's something we achieved, but um, it was not seamless. And the time to market is quite high. And, and just a quick question about that. Like, they were unique SKUs. When, when you say that, you mean like if I wanted to put up my wife's, you know, old Gucci belt or something, or even my Gucci belt, um, would, would, um, would that SKU um, be managed by me, the, the user, or would that then be managed by the, the, the system itself at the real real in the back end? Yeah, so it's consignment based, right? So you send in your item to us, we create the SKU, Got it. and then it's available at the price we set, and then you get a cut, right? So we manage it for you. You manage everything. Okay, got it. Understood. It's also it's possible. not peer to peer. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Frederick, I'm guessing it's also possible that uh, every piece of data is different, right? Because you have uh, different types of goods, maybe people selling there different forms of data and then maybe some days you have a lot of uh, demand on your backend system some days maybe it's less mm. so is it like in general we have heard that these kind of doing real-time analytics on e-commerce where the demand is fluctuating the data cha changes rapidly uh, is it very difficult from a people side of thing in the sense do you need a lot of people to manage these real-time analytic systems do you need to uh, if you want to make these real-time analytic systems be very mission critical. And um, how hard is it from the people side of thing or the human resources side of thing to keep them up and alive and ready to run 24 by seven? I'd say the biggest investment is just, you know, getting everything specced out, you know, the schema, where does the data live? Uh, what is it, like, what's the output? Is it in GraphQL endpoint? Is it a REST API? Does it live in S3 or is it, you know, in GCP? Uh, putting it, reading it from Kafka, like getting all of that stuff to work because usually it's siloed, you know, distributed teams. Uh, just getting it working end to end is probably the biggest investment, you know. But once everything up and running, at least at the real, real you know, if you have auto scaling, all that stuff, it's generally maintaining it's probably not so bad. But yeah, every time you make a change. Uh, it is time consuming, but I'd say the biggest investment is just getting it to work. So time to market is the biggest concern, I would say, like democratizing it. But once you have it up and running, it is an API that other people could use. Uh, but just if you have to do that every time, that's months of work, right? It's not minutes or days, it's months. Uh, so that's the biggest concern I had. Yeah, you mentioned something about schema change or data changing in format and shape. Uh, in that case, you need to probably have somebody go massage the data again to be to be useful for a real time app in the back end. And that's, I think, is the point that you are trying to make, right? Saying that time to market is kind of critical. So you need people doing some of these things. Uh, I saw yeah. similar uh, activity or a similar kind of uh, challenges when I was at Facebook building a lot of social applications, right? Uh, so they're also, um, I mean, real-time analytics was very important for us at the time. Uh, but even uh, with your background, you have experience in building social uh, applications. And then you also have great experience in building like a real uh, huge e-commerce backend. Um, like we know that for social applications, real-time analytics was super useful and impactful. Uh, how much is the impact if uh, for real-time analytics, not just analytics, but about real-time analytics on the e-commerce business or the e-commerce industry? 
Um, can you give us some examples or tidbits or opinions about how real-time analytics is useful in a global e-commerce perspective? Well, I, I think it's it's the rate that you can innovate, right? So let's say you can, like for us at the Rare Wheel, we had brick and mortar stores where we actually built our own point of sale uh, app that was actually you know customized fully native by us so that we could control the user experience. And, and in there, you know, we could, you know, recommend the products that a customer was looking at, uh, but maybe it was not available in the store, but it is available online or in another store. And, you know, that is actually, you know, in, you know, the average order value is high. So if you could just sell one more item from that uh, iPad point of sale app, that's, you know, an increase in, in your, in your, um, in your sales, right? So, so absolutely, you know, our ability to leverage real-time analytics to um, to build features is is essential, right? To move faster and to, to innovate uh, on a monthly basis, right? So you're talking mostly about like say personalization, like, and probably yes. when a customer visits your website or your application, can you give him personalized like real-time analytics? Uh, exactly, yeah. So recommended, but based upon their you know, previous browsing or purchase history, but also in their size, right? Because you don't want to recommend, you know, something that's not, you know, like a shoe or a pant, because every single SKU is unique, right? So right. we might only have that other thing in another size, but then we should not recommend it to you, right? So it's it's multifaceted, uh, pretty complex searches. And anytime you need to join, you know, data with another silo, then that's days or weeks of work, uh, to, to get it to, to the real-time API. That's a good point that you make because you talked about joining different silos of data, right? Some data could be in your database and some data could be in your streaming system and you probably want to join them together. Is that what you were uh, hinting yes, at? Yes, exactly, yeah. Mm, yeah, I think, um, I mean, real-time analytics is kind of uh, difficult, but I think you also have a lot of uh, general purpose analytics, uh, which is about not maybe very real time, but something which can crunch a lot of past historical data for the user or um, browsing history of the user, which is in the past. Um, and for e-commerce applications, um, do you think that uh, these two go hand in hand, being ability to be able to scan or process a large set of data that has been generated historically? versus ability to join it with the most recent data or the most real time data that is being produced as and when the person is looking for an item. Uh, is it important to be able to get a, a, a kind of a mesh or a join between these two data sets to give them good uh, experience on your website? I mean, absolutely. I think it's common now that you have multiple data stores to of the customer, right? If you have a 360, of your customer's data, it's some of it's going to live in, you know, maybe a Postgres database. Some of it maybe lives in Snowflake or BigQuery, another one in Salesforce, right? Uh, <clears throat> joining that, it's, it's not, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like it's something you have to spend a lot of engineering time, you know, putting it somewhere where you can join it easily. So uh, I'd rather you use a managed product uh, for me if I can, you know, just to move faster. Um, moving faster is definitely something I think that is kind of uh, what we see from most of users of uh, analytic systems, right? Whether it's real time or not. Um, but I was chatting about this with Geo the other day and we were just chatting about some general purpose uh, data challenges that Geo was mentioning. Uh, what was your exact thing that you were asking me Geo the other day? So the 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 fact that this is um, you know an analytics podcast, a lot of developers um, listen to us, right, and they're curious um, kind of about what their peers are facing. So, you know, not only have you you know been involved in leading teams and, and heading organizations, uh, engineering teams. Um, but you're also investing in companies that are that are helping companies manage their data. 
Um, what are some data challenges that engineering teams are facing today? Like, what are you hearing from teams that you've worked with, teams that you've led, and teams that you're, um, you know, running? Um, and, and how are they kind of overcoming those data challenges? I mean, I think some of them we've already discussed, but, you know, it's just the communication overhead. If you have an organization where you have, you know, maybe a data engineering team that kind of owns, you know, the analytical data, and then you have engineering teams or squads or pods owning the, you know, real-time data, so to speak, you know, whether it's in MySQL or Postgres or Dynamo, um, but then getting them to talk mm -hmm. is usually where the breakdowns happen or the time consumption happens, then they have to agree upon a standardized format, you know, how to consume that data. And then, you know, schema, like, is there a schema even, right? Maybe it's just, you know, maybe the schema changes, no one knows about it. <laughs> are they using Avro for Kafka or not? Uh, those are all things that have to be in place before you can start to really move, start to move faster, right? So the first few um, iterations are gonna go a lot slower, but once you're up and running, it's usually faster, but still there's infrastructure, right? So you gotta deploy uh, an API <clears throat> and a data engineering team that might not be their strength, right? They're probably not, you know, writing REST or GraphQL uh, queries uh, the day in and day out. So now they need to learn how to deploy that. What's available to them? You know, can they use uh, Lambda or Kubernetes? And that, that might be a whole new thing. So like who does what is usually a pretty big time sink and like, ideally we're all full stack but that's in practice that's not how it works because you can't have front-end developers doing the data engineers work and vice versa so you that's where i would say the, the biggest challenges are um and you know the way to to overcome that is well i guess a use a managed solution if there is one use a framework or document what you do but in general try to build reusable systems, right? So ideally getting to self-serve where, you know, you can automate as much as possible. So that if I want to display data from two or three different data sources, it should not take weeks. It should take me a few minutes to start testing and then a few days to get to staging and maybe a week or two to production. But that's for sure not happening in reality, at least not <laughs> in my experience. I, I like to ask folks, you know, that that our guests, right, if you could give one piece of advice, what would it be? I think that was a good piece of advice that you just gave. So you just answered that question without me asking it. Um, what, you know, in order to do that, though, like, what are some steps from an engineering leadership perspective? Right, you've been, a, you know, a director of engineering, you've been a CTO, like what, what advice then would you give to leaders? to take those steps, right? Because they're the, it's the leaders that have to kind of understand the challenges and make life easier for their teams. Yeah, I mean, I'd say this one is more challenging because like where does the data live? Like who, who, who reports into who? Sometimes, you know, BI or data engineering, the data team lives under marketing or even under the CFO. Um, that could create, you know, a lot of uh, friction or you know, things can go quite slower and then maybe should they move under engineering instead and what does that mean um, and that could be that's a pretty significant uh, you know obstacle to to overcome um, I guess yeah there's probably more things uh, that you can do to improve it and obviously documentation automating it and achieving the self-serve right that's really that should be the goal so that data isn't just sitting there siloed and is protected by you know three or four people and people are scared to ask them <laughs> no right. data is for everyone and we own it right there's mm -hmm. no he or she or it's it's just we it, data is for us to use and then uh, go get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's almost like the operational side of it is facilitating that streamlining it, providing access to the right people at the right time so that they have the self-service to be able to do something with the data versus waiting around. Uh, you know, I, I have a project to build it, the tool to build, and I can't build it because I'm going back and forth with trying to figure out access 
to it. We hear that a lot in, in you know, both yeah. large and small um, enterprises. And you mentioned the hierarchy, where does the data live? Who owns the data documentation, automation? I mean, these are all things that engineering leaders, um, you know, need to, need to answer uh, questions that they need to answer and solve uh, in order to make their kind of uh, data culture uh, move at the, at the speed of real time. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd like to think of it as, you know, uh, usually you have analysts or even business with, you know, SQL skills, they can query, you know, whether it's Tableau, Looker, they could query, you know, the, the analytical data it should be the same for real time use cases with features, right? A developer should be able to say, all right, I want to use this uh, in my feature or product manager, and that should be readily available. If it's not, I mean, that's an opportunity to invest in. Uh, but it, it's exciting to see because I'd say it's a fairly recent trend, maybe the last three years where it's actually happening. Super interesting. Well, that'll do it for this episode. Uh, of the Rockset Real-Time Analytics Podcast. Um, Frederick and Andrew, but thank you so much for your time, uh, your insights today. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast and you found um, the episode insightful, please share the episode. Um, help us share the thought leadership and the insights on real-time analytics with uh, your team, your peers. The Why Wait uh, real-time analytics podcast is brought to you by Rockset. At Rockset, we're building a real-time analytics cloud-based platform. Check us out at rockset.com. Uh, if you can try uh, real-time analytics today, you know, feel free to, to give us a shot. You, know, you can sign up for free for two weeks uh, with a $300 free trial credits. Once again, thank you for joining, gentlemen. Thank you for the audience for listening and stay tuned for our next episode. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye. you. Bye.